began to question Jesus, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to obtain eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor father and mother. The man answered, I've done all these things and kept them from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said, There's one thing you still lack. Sell all that you possess, distribute it among the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When the man heard this, he became very sad, for he was extremely wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for the wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. They who heard it said, Then who can be saved? And Jesus said, The things which are impossible for human beings are possible with God. Um, so, last week, if you remember, if you were here, <laughs> uh, I was sort of preaching about the, the way in which when two stories get stuck together, clippings, I use the word clippings, like newspaper clippings, because uh, that's actually the word we use in, in, um, in when we're talking about this stuff. We use a word that basically means clippings. These stories that floated around, when they get put together in a certain way, each story has its own meaning, but when they put them together, there's another meaning on top of it, of what you call a meta-meaning or a, um, um, what's actually called a redactional meaning. But anyway, uh, it's, and so when Luke attaches two stories together, he's communicating something. So when we're talking about the Gospels, we predominantly, there's... There's these three settings that we now, and for some reason in theology, in the study of um, the Bible, we, there's a lot of German, so in, it's called Sitz and Laban, but it just means life setting. There are these life settings, and the first life setting is, you know, Palestine in, you know, the year 29 or 30. In other words, when the event actually occurs. And then, the, then there's a, a middle life setting, the second life setting, and it's the setting of the church remembering stories but also, you understand the church not only remembers stories, but it forgets stories, too. Stuff gets, is, there is stuff that gets unremembered. So this is a kind of natural editing process that goes on. As the stories get remembered and passed on, those stories are the stories which most effectively introduce who Jesus is. But they don't tell us a lot about Jesus, like um, how tall was he? What day was his birthday? What color was the clothes? I mean, was he a winter so that he wore blacks and whites and reds? Or was he more like a spring where he would wear, you know, greens and yellows? We don't know this. In fact, we have almost no descriptions of him at all. The only one that I'm aware of is in the book of Revelations. And I, in the book of Revelations, I mean, you know, I, I, I can't help wondering if not only the Holy Spirit but mushrooms were involved. Um, they, <sighs> you know, it's kind of crazy. <clears throat> so in there, Jesus is described, though, as having hair like wool. Now, I don't know if that is intended to communicate that it was white, because not all wool is white, or if it has to do with the texture of the hair, and that his skin was the color of burnt bronze, so very dark-skinned. Um, but that's Revelation, so I'm not sure what to make of that. Uh, so all I can say is 
we don't have a lot of those kinds of details. Now, the first generation, when they would talk about Jesus, they would picture him in their mind because they knew him. They'd seen him, so they knew what he looked like. But no one else seemed to bother asking. And it didn't get written down, and nobody seemed to care very much. Um, so you have to understand that during that phase, the remembering church phase, stuff gets forgotten and lost. And some of it would be very interesting to us now, but in terms of the church itself, the church didn't think it was important to remember those things, uh, in part because the first generation knew them, and they were just like, duh. And, uh, and they were interested in introducing the who, not the what about Jesus, the who he is. Now you come to the third setting, and that's where it gets written down in the Gospels. So the process of writing it down in the Gospels is, a, is a, its own kind of, like, what order do you put things in? Where do you put things? How do you tell the story? What changes do you make? And so in that place, we see the hand of the writer. We see their hand at work. And when we compare the three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we can sometimes really see their hand at work. Uh, so um, we kind of get that in Luke. We see him doing things like when he's talking to people, he, uh, uh, he, he tends to describe things as, as if they happened not in Palestine, but somewhere in the northern Mediterranean. So he describes the architecture, houses, not as being flat-roofed and sort of built the way they are in Palestine, but instead being um, tile-roofed houses. So that's about how much rain you get. If you don't get much rain, you have a flat-roofed house, and then the roof becomes a, a useful place. But if you live in a place with a fair amount of rain, you have to have a tile roof to run the rain off. And so he describes a tile roof in a story that happened in Palestine where they didn't have tile roofs. And so he does this as a way of, of relating it to his audience. And, uh, and he, does, he does some of these things here. So, so when, when we do the story, like last week, I was working in that area, that third setting. I was talking about the meaning that the story picks up by the way Luke handles it. So that's a layer of, of message. But today I want to really talk about this story in its first setting. In other words, here's this guy who comes to Jesus. And we, have a, we can easily miss what's going on here uh, because... Because we're kind of like this guy in that we have a lot of stuff. And we can't, getting rid of our stuff is really hard. Have you ever tried to get rid of your stuff? Have you ever just say, I'm going to get rid of my stuff. And then you like throw it out or give it to Goodwill. And it's really a struggle. Like, ah, it's my stuff. I don't want to. And then, of course, as soon as you get rid of your stuff, then you have to replace it with new stuff. But for a lot of people, stuff is, you have to store your stuff. Because you don't want to get rid of your stuff. So, you know, while there could be people who could use your stuff, you need to hold on to it. So here we are with what? We've got our, uh, we've got garages. And so you take the car, which is maybe your most expensive asset, and you park it on the street or in the driveway, and you fill your garage with junk that's not worth a half of what your car is worth, right? <laughs> or or we, we rent, we, we pay rent to store stuff that we're not using and are never going to use again that someone else could be using, but they're not going to use it either because we're storing it. So this is how we are with our stuff. So we read the story and we think to ourselves, yeah, that could be me. But we're, we miss that. We miss a layer that lies underneath here. And so i got to get you to that layer. And the clue for us is the reaction of the disciples when Jesus makes that comment, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I should mention that um, uh, if, if you read it in your Bible, you may run across the following phrase that comes afterwards. It is harder for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. Um, but uh, some translations include that in Luke, but it's probably not part of the original in Luke. And the reason is that's a, that's a geographical focus that refers to a gate in Jerusalem. And so if you weren't familiar with Jerusalem, that wouldn't mean anything. You'd kind of lose the sense of it. And so it, apparently Luke left it out originally, but it got added back in because everyone knew the story so well that you had to put it back in. So, but the thing you have to get at is the reaction of the disciples. Well, who can be saved then? Now, why are they so surprised by this? What is it? I mean, they must all the time have people coming up to Jesus and talking to him about eternity. He's always talking about eternal life. And suddenly they're going, well, who can be saved? If a rich guy can't be saved, who can be saved? Why would they even ask that question? The reason is, in the ancient world... And interestingly enough, in America, <coughs> um, there is an assumption that wealth is a sign of God's favor. Right? And if you're poor, there's something wrong with you. God doesn't like you. You're cursed. You're, you're accursed. You're, and it's your fault. And somehow it's God and you. I mean, the reason you're poor is because there's something wrong with you spiritually, and so you're poor. 
And so in, even in our culture, we have this idea that wealth is, a, is proof of God's favor and that poverty is proof of God's judgment. And that's why it's so easy for us in our country to criticize poor people. Now, I've known a lot of poor people. And there are some poor people who, you know, because the poor people we always like to talk about are the ones who, you know, they could work, but they don't, right? They need to learn the word work. Okay, so I've known some people like that. I mean, I've literally known people who you can, you can you know, lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. I mean, you know, I, I knew a guy with a situation. I knew a situation. He talks to me about a situation. Here's my situation. I said, okay, let me see if I can help you. I got him a job that perfectly solved his problem. I mean, was unreal. It was exactly everything that he could possibly want in a job. He lasted less than a... Did he even last a week? I'm not sure. Right? So here's a guy who doesn't want to work. He wants his problem solved, but he doesn't want to work. So we talk about that guy, and we go, eh, you got a problem there. But I have known a lot of people who are poor for a whole lot of other reasons, like mental illness, undiagnosed often, or certainly untreated, so that they can't work. I mean, I know people who come to me and say, I want a job. And I'm thinking to myself, you can't take a job. If you got a job, you won't keep it. You won't be able to keep that job for more than a, a, a couple of months, and then they're going to fire you because you're mentally ill, and that's just going to come out. And I see that. I see that. And so a person like that will always be poor, right? So there's mental illness. There's what if you grew up in a family where, it was, where the only question was ever asked is how are we going to pay the rent this month, right? So everything was in that crisis moment. Every dollar that came in had to be spent on something. There was never any money. There was never any future. It was always right now. I have $10 right now, so I got to go and buy this. And, and if that's how you grow up, no matter how, you could go to college and have a great job, and that's still how your life is going to be. You'll be walking, you might be living in a house in the suburbs, but you'll be so in debt that you're still asking the question, I mean, you're really actually poor. It just looks like you've got a lot. And you're asking the question, how am I going to pay the light bill this month? And it's just crisis to crisis to crisis to crisis. And so, I, you know, I've known poor people, all kinds of poor people. It, it's not that God hates them. And I've known rich people, too, who are complete jerks and clearly don't have any room in their life for God. So even though in our country, like in ancient Israel, there was this idea that if you were wealthy, that somehow you were more spiritual by virtue of being wealthy, that's simply not the case. It's just not that way. I should tell you the early Christians were actually fairly anti-wealth. Troubling to me because I have, I, I'm, yeah, <laughs> I have stuff that I don't want to get rid of. Um, but the early Christians were anti fairly anti-wealth, or I should say anti-accumulation of wealth. They were very much about giving it away, not holding on to it, having treasure in heaven, not, not trying to build a, a treasury on earth. How many times does Jesus say, store your, heaven, your treasures in heaven where moth cannot rust, where thief cannot steal, right? This is, a, this is how Christians thought. So the disciples, though, haven't gotten to that point yet. That comes from them later. In, in, in once they understand more, that's when they become okay with the idea of a kind of intentional uh, poverty, a, a giving away, not trying to hold on to. But at this point in their time with Jesus, they still are operating in the world, and they think that, the, that wealthy people must be blessed of God. So here we've got this guy who comes to Jesus, and he's wealthy. But he feels the lack. I mean, he's, he's, he's actually trying to be intentional about it. He's, I give him credit for this. So he's not trying to hold on to uh, his particular um, idea that because he's wealthy, he must be spiritual. He's actually trying to live it, but he's still, feeling, he's still feeling the lack. I'm intrigued by the fact that when he comes to Jesus, he says, what must I do to obtain eternal life? As if eternal life is one more thing for him to hold on to, one more possession for him to own, one more thing for him to acquire and add to his collection of things that he has. But you also have to understand that in the process of that, there's also a burden that this guy has as wealthy. And the burden is that as a wealthy man in ancient Israel, all of his wealth is family wealth. He inherited it which meant that he becomes the, board of, the head of the board of directors of the family company. It's automatic. It's expected of him. He is bound by the burden uh, at the same time that we look at him as being wealthy and lucky. He's also bound by the burden of his wealth. It's piled on him. There's all of these expectations on him, how he's supposed to be, how he's supposed to act, who he's supposed to be. And he carries all of that around. And so when Jesus is looking at him, um, it's interesting that Luke leaves out what Mark says. Mark says Jesus had compassion for the man. Luke leaves that out in part because Luke is interested in, in something that we'll talk about next week. Uh, but, but 
Mark has Mark makes the point that Jesus feels really bad for this guy and before he tells him okay it's not bad news I mean because when the guy first comes up and says what do I have to do to inherit eternal life Jesus response is like well you know the answer to that one right why are you even asking you know the answer but only after only after they get into a conversation does Jesus look a little deeper and see where this guy's pain is and has compassion for him and says, I know how to set you free. I know how to set you free. You gotta set aside all of this stuff. Sell all your possessions, which means you're also resigning from the board of directors of the company. You're also stepping away from this life that everyone has planned for you, all of these expectations that everyone has laid upon you, all of these ideas that, that you have about who you're supposed to be. To give everything away and to distribute it among the poor is to step away from all of that, to step away from material possessions, but maybe more importantly, to step away from that whole idea of what it means to be me. This whole notion of who he is as a person, his status in the community, his status vis-a-vis -vis his wealth, his position of power in terms of family and, and society around him. He's to step away from all of that. One of the hardest things that it, there is is to figure out who we are, right? To just be ourselves. I mean, think about this. Think about all of the roles that we have that we're playing and, and there's a place we can, we can be those things, and it really has a lot of integrity to us. But most of the time, we're being those things because we're following someone else's script, somebody else's idea of how we're supposed to be. So we not only have all this accumulation of wealth, but we're also playing this kind of game that's been laid on us, all of the expectations. It is hard to let go of your stuff, but it is even harder to let go of who you think you are and who you think you're supposed to be, and who everyone around you thinks you're supposed to be. To let it all go, and to finally just follow Jesus. Can you find the prayer response? Let's pray that together. There is so much I hold on to, so many things, so many obligations, so many shoulds and have-tos I feel bound by. I beat myself up with all I am supposed to do, all the unmet responsibilities I lay in my path, all the expectations I accept from those around me. Jesus, you are calling me to release and freedom, but it is so hard for me to relinquish all this stuff, to lay down who I think I am supposed to be and simply follow you. In fact, sometimes it feels impossible but nothing is impossible for you. Help me, Lord Jesus, to just let it all go. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you. May your countenance